Good afternoon. The National Assembly of Wales is now in session. Now, as well as being uh, a day to celebrate our patron saint, today also marks the 10th anniversary of the official opening of the building, the Assembly's home, the Senedd. Many of you were here 10 years ago when the Senedd first opened, and some of you have continued uh, the privilege of representing the people of Wales, or hopefully you will have the privilege of serving them 10 years from now. Now, the Senedd has established itself as one of the most distinctive buildings in the country and as an integral part of Welsh public life. We welcome through our doors 1.3 million visitors from Wales, the UK, and much further afield, and we've conducted nearly 30,000 tours. The building uh, has hosted many major events, including the Wales national rugby team, Six Nation, Grand Slam celebration, and the homecoming of the Welsh Olympians and Paralympians. Now, whilst this is a place that the people of Wales come to visit and celebrate national achievements, it is primarily a space for the Assembly to debate, consider, and make decisions about the future of our country. Decisions rooted in the principles of access accessibility and transparency, which are also represented by the very fabric of this fine building. And now we move to the first item this afternoon, which is questions to the First Minister. And first is Roger Glyn Thomas. How nice for Premier. Will the First Minister make a statement on referral to treatment times in West Wales? Well, I expect all patients to be seen in order of clinical priority and within Welsh Government waiting time targets. To assist this, we have set up a planned care programme led by clinicians to develop sustainable solutions. A surgeon from England contacted me because his mother had been taken into the stroke unit in Glanguilly Hospital and he deeply regretted the fact that the physiotherapy service wasn't in place there for his mother. He said that it was entirely inadequate. Those were his, were his words and since then many staff patients and the families of patients have contacted me because it's clear that in terms of orth orthopaedic treatment that patients are initially referred to the physiotherapy department rather than being referred to the surgery department and as a result of that the physiotherapy resources are very few and far between in the Hoelda Health Board area. Will you speak to the Minister and Deputy Minister responsible for these issues in order to ensure that this practice ceases and that patients are given the treatment that they deserve in Glanguilly Hospital? Well, as the member knows, I am not aware that of this case, but it's important that this be considered. I will ask the Minister to write to the member in order to respond to the questions he's posed in the Chamber this afternoon. Uh, uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, one way of tackling referral to treatment crimes in West Wales is to tackle recruitment and staff retention problems in the area. Now, in order to address these recruitment problems, it's important that we ensure that we have an appropriate number of training places available for doctors and nurses in these circumstances. Can you tell us what you as a government have done to ensure that these places are in place and can you tell us how many additional training places have been created over the past year for example? Well of course it's a matter for the deanery to ensure that these training places are available having said that we've seen the numbers being trained at Morriston Hospital rising and this should also be considered by how well they are when you think of the training places in that hospital as regards the how well they are figures more patients are being seen and the waiting times are reducing there's been an 86 percent reduction in those people waiting over eight weeks for a diagnostic test they've reduced since last year and of course we have seen for example a reduction in the numbers waiting more than 36 weeks and more patients receiving more cancer treatment and also of course more people receiving treatment within the targets for cancer treatment that we have set so the how well our figures have improved and of course we're continuing to work with the profession and also with the royal colleges in order to consider what other opportunities might be available to create training places across the whole of wales Thank you, william graham thanks presiding officer Will the Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's strategy to attract biotech investment into Wales? 
Well, we've committed to make Wales the best possible environment for life sciences, innovation and business growth. Our life sciences strategy sets out our priorities to attract biotech investment into Wales, including funding, proposition strengthening and ecosystem development. I'm grateful for the first minister for his reply. He'd be aware of rather critical comments recently, but he will also know that your predecessor was very keen that we should be a, a smart, small country. How important the attraction of this investment is to Wales, both for the future of this generation and future generations. Will the Minister outline what strategy he intends to employ to make sure this is another success? Well, the Life Sciences Investment Fund has, uh, to date, made 11 investments into nine uh, companies. It has attracted considerable levels of co-investment and significantly raised the global profile of the sector in Wales as a thriving location for life science uh, companies. On top of that, of course, uh, the Life Sciences Hub has been developed. That's welcomed more than 5,000 visitors. It's facilitated more than 80 life science events and 850 meetings, whilst uh, 81 member organisations have joined the Hub. Alan Roberts. Yoch. Um, Thank you. I heard to the uh, Wales Audit Office report uh, last week. Um, that confirms that the successful tender for delivery of the fund was paid £207,600 for deals that were in the pipeline in uh, October 2012, a further, uh, further uh, 480,000 uh, thereafter. Um, Finance Wales then asked for confirmation from the Welsh Government with regard to uh, confirmation from the Minister that they should pay the additional uh, sum that was being requested, but they refused to do so without confirmation from the Minister. The Welsh Government then went on to pay 370,800 um, directly to the successful tenderer um, and that was only some £32,000 less than the contract allowed for had he been in position to uh, sign the contract at the time originally intended. Can I ask whether or not the Welsh Government is in a position to explain the reasons for the totality of payments to the uh, successful tenderer under the interim arrangements and why no deductions were made to the tenderer given that they were unable during that period to perform one of the key functions because there was no registration under the uh, Financial Services Authority? Well, well, regarding the report itself, we will of course consider the report and respond in due course uh, in a comprehensive manner. We now move to questions to the party leaders and first this afternoon, leader of Clyde Crummy, Liam Wood. Happy St David's Day to you all. Day to, to everyone. First Minister, I'm aware that there's to be a statement later on on the Wales Bill, but on the day of our National Patron Saint and given developments this week, I think it's important to focus on the matter fully now. The Secretary of State for Wales has decided to press the pause button and delay the bill at now until the summer. Do you agree that the forthcoming Assembly elections are an opportunity to seek a mandate from people on the nature of devolution? And do you agree with Plaid Cymru that it is their will, will that should shape the future of devolution and that act rather than the whim of Westminster? Well, well, well she and I are uh, very much on the same page when it comes to our view of the Wales Bill. Uh, I'll go into more detail when I, when I make the statement, but suffice to say, uh, it's quite clear that the points that were made by the Welsh Government uh, have influenced the course of action that the Secretary of State has taken. The Leader of Plaid Cymru is absolutely right to say that these things are a matter for the people of Wales, and it's for the people of Wales to decide what degree of power they wish to see devolved. I would agree with that, First Minister, but the nature and pace of Welsh devolution has been a clear point of division within your party. Labour MPs, including Labour Secretaries, Secretaries of State for Wales over many years, have acted as roadblocks on Wales's devolution journey. Can you then give us an assurance today, First Minister, that the current position of the Welsh Government is the same as the current position of the Labour Party, and if it is one position, can you tell us, please, what exactly is your vision for the next stage of Welsh devolution? Well, well first of all, I'd remind the Leader of Plaid Cymru that it was uh, a Welsh Government uh, led by Welsh Labour that delivered the referendum in 2011 in the first place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we did campaign alongside uh, the parties, of course, uh, very strongly and very hard to make sure that we delivered an overwhelming uh, yes vote in, uh, in 2011. 
uh, the view of the Welsh Labour Party and the Welsh Government is one and the same. Uh, the bill was inadequate. Uh, it was never going to be sustainable, and we wait to see uh, what the Secretary of State wants to do next. But to my mind, uh, Minister of Crown consents. I mean, they were, what, as proposed in the bill, they were, they were unacceptable. Same with the necessity test, same with the reservations. And the issue of creating a sustainable constitutional framework for Wales cannot be done without addressing the issue of the jurisdiction. First Minister, you and I know that it was Plaid Cymru in that government that drove that referendum <laughs> on further <laughs> powers. You, you were pulled to that table in many instances, kicking and screaming, First Minister. First Minister, Welsh devolution has been stalling because of splits in Labour, just as the UK's place in the European Union is under threat because of splits in the Conservative Party. It's no coincidence, is it, First Minister, that the nation with the weakest devolution settlement, the least generous funding arrangements and the least influence is the only nation left with a Labour government. Now, I wonder if you can tell us, is there a single concession that you've won for Welsh devolution during your decade as First Minister that wouldn't have been secured in any event. Put simply, First Minister, what have you won from Westminster for the people of Wales? The referendum itself, for a start, that gave us the powers to do what we have done the past 24 Acts since uh, 2011. Uh, a large body of legislation proposed by government, uh, a body of legislation that the Assembly itself I was able to scrutinise properly because we know that sound legislation has been uh, the result. Uh, and so uh, we have delivered on the referendum. I, I, I do regret suggesting that somehow we were reluctant in 2011. You can't truly think that I was reluctantly spending every day campaigning uh, in, uh, in favour of a, of a yes vote. Uh, and indeed that it, that it was uh, Welsh Labour, who, and indeed her party as well, who delivered uh, the votes on the voters that were needed to make sure that this place became a proper legislature. And we will continue uh, to make the case of the UK government that, that uh, we that process to continue. Now, she asked me what influence have we had. We have made sure that the Secretary of State was not able to proceed with the Wales Bill as he proposed. Uh, we were the ones who uh, pointed out the weaknesses constitutionally. We were the ones that pointed out the issues regarding Minister of Crown Consent, the issues regarding the necessity test, the issues regarding the reservations, and indeed the issues regarding the jurisdiction uh, and the need for a distinct uh, jurisdiction. So from our point of view, as a government, we have made sure that we very much stood up for Wales's interests. We now move to the Leader of Opposition, Andrew R.G. Davis. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, First Minister, last week we heard from the current member for the Rhondda uh, that he had a rousing reception at the Labour Party conference in Llandidno. Uh, we also also get a very good reception here, no doubt before he sends up his sent-off packing. The point I want to ask you, First Minister, is you launched your pledge card at that conference. One thing at this assembly you've spent a lot of time in the last five years is talking about local government reorganisation. And time and time again, you've commissioned reports, such as the Williams Report, pieces of work to look what would be the best local government map for Wales going forward. Can you confirm today, because the one thing that didn't come out of your conference was, can you confirm today, if you are re-elected in May, and God help us if you are, that Vale of Glamorgan, Pembrokeshire, Carmarthenshire, Monmouthshire, Denbyshire and Conwy will disappear from the face of the local government map here in Wales? Well, uh, I think that he's, uh, that's a sign of desperation for the Leader of the Opposition that he's already given up on the election campaign. Uh, there we are. It's an interesting uh, comment that he made. Uh, local government mergers were, we would seek to move ahead with in order to provide a stronger basis for local government in Wales. We've always said that. I take it by your answer, you do mean that if the people of Wales were to re-elect you, and I'm sure they're not going to do that, but if they were to re-elect you, <laughs> they, they would be losing the Vale of Glamorgan, Monmouthshire, P Pembrokeshire, Carmarthenshire, Denbyshire and Conwy, and ultimately those great place names will disappear from the face of Wales and people will lose the services that they depend on from those local authorities. But the one thing, the one thing that you and I can agree on, I hope, I hope, is that the health service needs total reorganisation like a hole in the head. Yeah. Under, under Labour in the last 10 years, along with Plaid Cymru, we've had two reorganisations. 
Can you confirm on your assessment of where the NHS is at the moment, First Minister, that the NHS does not need complete reorganisation here in Wales that would be devastating to morale and costly in financial terms? Well, um, first things first. Uh, Pembrokeshire, Radnorshire, Breckenshire, Denbyshire, Flintshire were all abolished in 1974 by his party. So, in fact, in fact, his party a very good track record of abolishing historic counties in Wales, and now he accuses us of doing the same thing. He's forgotten that, that it was, it was the Heath government who actually took that forward under the Local Government uh, Act. So we're not going to take any lessons from the Conservative Party on local government reorganisation. They got rid of the 13 counties at that point, and then they imposed 22 authorities that nobody wanted in the mid-90s. There will be no wholesale reorganisation of the health service. We want to see the health service deliver, and we don't want to see it uh, end up as a giant quango. Uh, we don't want to see it uh, in, in a position where, where we have health boards that only look at their own area. We want to have a health uh, service where health boards work together to deliver the best for the people of Wales. Well, you got there in the end, and I think you did confirm that you agree with me that reorganisation of the health service, complete reorganisation of the health service, is something that's completely unwarranted and is not needed here in Wales. Although you did bizarrely talk about Radnorshire when I didn't even mention Radnorshire to you, First Minister, but there you go. Abolished it. That's, Abolished it. that's something time and time again you'll bring up. Order. Order. First Minister, Order. one of the other pledges you talked of coming out of your conference was the right to buy, the help to buy scheme that your government... 18 months after the UK government brought forward in England, actually brought into Wales. And you talked of this would give a leg up to home buyers in Wales. Well, actually, you're talking about taking two thirds of the budget from the help to buy scheme out in this financial year. How is taking two thirds of that budget out helping people to get the home that they require across Wales. If you look at the figures, in Ceredigion, only six people benefited from the scheme. In Newport, 435 people benefited from it. So how are you giving home buyers a leg up when you're taking two thirds of that budget away from people in Wales? Well, first of all, the scheme is demand led. Secondly, what we will not do is see the continued sell off of public housing. Yeah. Which is why we're not we're going to abolish the right to buy. Why? Because otherwise it's the equivalent of trying to fill up a bath with a plug out, uh, which is what the Conservative Party wants to do. I mean, I'm looking again at the figures that they put forward in terms of housing. Wanted to cut the environment, sustainability, and housing budget by 25%. There we are. Uh, just to remind us all of where they actually uh, where they actually stand uh, on on this. And I have, to, uh, I have to remind him that I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about uh, our pledges, our six pledges to the people of Wales. We believe they resonate with the people of Wales. They are ambitious for Wales, and they are six pledges that we believe people will be supportive of. We look forward to seeing what the Conservative Party will produce, and we particularly look forward to seeing their costings, because the last time we asked them this, they said they hadn't crunched the numbers. We now move to the leader of Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, this week we've seen news reports of doctor shortages across the UK and uh, a poll today that says that the NHS is the top concern uh, for people in Wales. Now, last week in questions, you said that you were not aware of any patients suffering due to a lack of GPs in North Wales. And in response, the chairman of the Royal College of GPs in North Wales said, and I quote, the number of GPs working full-time has not increased and GP provision in the north is getting worse. Patients are bearing the brunt of this with longer waiting times and pressurised consultations. What makes you think that you know better than GPs working on the ground in North Wales? Well, can I answer that question in two ways? First of all, to outline uh, where we are in terms of doctor numbers in Wales. And secondly, what we're doing to address challenges in some parts of Wales, which undoubtedly are there. The number of hospital consultants working in the Welsh NHS increased by nearly 50% between 2004 and 2014. The number of medical and dental staff has increased by 27.5%. The number of GPs, and that excludes registrars, retainers and locums, uh, saw an increase of 10.5% during that time. Uh, we've about two th we've, there were 2,006 GPs as of September 2014. Between 2013 and 14, 137 new GPs joined the profession in Wales, and the number of registered patients per GP practitioner has fallen by 5.5% 5 .5 to 1,582. That said, there are parts of Wales where there are challenges in attracting uh, GPs. What we're doing is working with the BMA, with the GPC, uh, with the Royal College in order to address those particular issues, 
and of course to encourage more people to work in those parts of Wales that, that have experienced difficulties with recruitment in the recent past. I'm glad you've acknowledged that the figure for GP increases uh, is 10 per cent. I think maybe the answers that you gave last week could have been misunderstood by people when you said that you'd recruited over 2,000 GPs. I mean, we do have 2,006 GPs in Wales, but we haven't recruited an additional 2,000 GPs in the last 10 years. And your documents do state that a number of health boards have identified difficulties in recruiting general practitioners. And what that means for patients was reflected in your own health survey when 40% of those who responded to the Wales Health Report said that they'd had difficulty securing a GP appointment. Now, will you accept that there are issues with GP recruitment and a knock-on effect to patients gaining an appointment, or should we conclude that the North Wales GP, in response to your questions last week, accused you of being removed from reality? You know, who is right? Well, I do use a GP, as do everybody else, as does everyone else in Wales. So uh, it's not as if we're removed from reality. I think it's right to say that, that, that there's, in, there is, there's inconsistency uh, in different services across Wales. That's true. There are some GP surgeries where it is possible to get an appointment tomorrow. I know them. Uh, there are others where it's more difficult. And working with a professional, we want to make sure that those inconsistencies, they are, indep they are independent contractors at the end of the day, but those in inconsistencies are ironed out. In fairness, the profession has responded to that. We've seen more GP surgeries now open uh, during core hours. We're seeing more open in the, uh, in the evenings. And that's something we want to work with the profession on to, uh, to make sure that, that trend continues in the future. Of course, what we do need to do is ensure that we are training uh, more people to become GPs, to work in our health service. But Wales has only filled 85% of its GP training places. That's a total of 107 new trainees. But based on expected future demands, we need to be training 190 new trainees every year. Now, given the difficulties of recruiting to existing training places and the fact that those training places will not meet future demand for general practitioner services, would you agree with me, potentially the problem is going to get worse for patients in Wales, not better? No, I take the point about uh, ensuring that we can train as many people as possible, but the reality is for more than 50 years we have attracted doctors into Wales from other countries. It'll always be the case. It has been the case since that time. The key to recruiting more GPs is to create the environment for them where they can prosper, where they can innovate, uh, where they can truly feel part of, of a community and working for a, for a community. It's not about money. Uh, it's about making sure that, that um, the freedoms that to innovate are there, the GPs would, would, uh, would want to see and those freedoms that they would want to use. We say, and we constantly look to recruit uh, abroad, we say to doctors abroad in other countries, come to Wales. It's a good working uh, environment. And historically, over the past 50 years or more, we have recruited from, uh, from other countries. We will continue, of course, to work with the uh, profession to make sure that we can attract more uh, GP uh, training places. There is a problem across England, Wales and Northern Ireland in terms of recruiting uh, doctors. So it's not a, it's not a problem that, that is pe peculiar to Wales, but nevertheless, it's an issue that we look with the profession to address. We now move back to questions on the paper. And question three is Julie Morgan. <coughs> uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. What plans does the Welsh Government have to invest in more skilled manufacturing jobs in South Wales? The Skills Implementation Plan sets out a key role for regional <coughs> skills partnerships to advise Welsh Government on future prioritisation of skills funding in line with regional employment and skills needs. And both uh, regional skills partnerships in the south of Wales identified advanced materials and manufacturing as a priority sector for their regions. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response. Um, is there anything the Welsh Government would, can do to help support uh, GE Healthcare's operations at Forest Farm um, in my constituency in Cardiff North, perhaps to uh, d diversify um, in view of the fact that um, 86 roles are being lost, the manufacture of uh, paper products used in the pharmaceutical industry are going to China and some research roles are being lost. And of course, um, it's not in an assisted area um, where it's located. So is there anything the government can do to help? Yes, we are working with GE Healthcare to identify alternative employment opportunities for the affected staff within the growing number of life sciences companies uh, in Wales. Uh, we supported the creation of the GE Innovation Village, which has attracted eight life sciences SMEs to establish their business at the GE site. And officials are in discussion with GE Healthcare to explore how further space at GE could provide space to house innovative SMEs in order, of course, to provide opportunities for those whose jobs might be at risk at the moment. 
Aldous Hussain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, as well as any investment in bringing skilled manufacturing jobs to Wales, there needs to be investment in developing those skills. What is your government doing to involve the manufacturing sector in designing the national curriculum and increasing uptake of STEM subjects? Well, it's, it's uptake of STEM subjects is important, but skills more generally important to manufacturing as well. We know that Wales is uh, a country where manufacturers want to come. We saw that with Aston Martin uh, last week. After two years uh, of hard work, uh, working with Aston Martin, we beat off competition from 19 other sites to get that investment into the Vale of Glamorgan. Uh, in terms of developing further skills, well, two examples I can give, Jobs Growth Wales. We, Jobs Growth Wales was a scheme that was born of discussions with SMEs. They were saying to us that they needed to uh, train people. They had jobs for them, but they didn't have the time or the money to train them. And that's why Jobs Growth Wales was so successful. And of course, as a member will be aware, we have plans to create 100,000 apprenticeships for all ages in the coming assembly. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. And on that point, I think we would be agreed, First Minister, that we do need new apprenticeships to promote this agenda. Can you therefore provide us with some clarity? You've just mentioned 100,000 apprenticeships. Is that 100,000 as a total by the end of the next assembly? which, by the way, is the same target as Plaid Cymru, or an additional 100,000 on top of the 50,000 that are already in place? Well, we're talking about during the next five years of the Assembly, and even more than that, what's important is that we should target people of all ages, bearing in mind the fact that it's very difficult to get a job for life these days, and so it's extremely important that people have the opportunity to retrain during their working lifetime. Uh, First Minister, investments like the, um, the uh, Aston Martin uh, factory in St Athens are a fantastic opportunity for local people, so long as they can access uh, the opportunities for training and development. But um, older apprentices have said to me that a barrier to them taking on an apprenticeship is the financial cost of doing so. What will the Welsh Government be doing in practical terms to make sure that apprenticeships are truly open to people of all ages? Well, that is what we intend to do post-May. Uh, uh, Aston Martin's mentioned as an example. Uh, we have been working with Aston Martin in order to uh, develop uh, the skills that they need for the future. They're confident they can find those skills in the area anyway. Uh, and we will continue to work not just with Aston Martin, but with other uh, companies in order to ensure that we understand what their skills and needs are, and then, of course, to meet them. Christine Chapman. Minister, investment in uh, manufacturing brings with it the opportunities for good quality apprenticeships and I do welcome uh, Welsh Labour's commitment to 100,000 extra apprenticeships in the next Assembly term. Manufacturing apprentices tend to be male so more needs to be done to encourage women into these roles and the cross-party women in the economy group has put forward suggestions on how we can do this by for example uh, disaggregating data by gender and having more female tutors and mentors will, will you uh, look at how we can take these suggestions forward to get the very best apprentices and tap into all of the welsh talent pool uh, absolutely it's hugely important that in, in, in industries that are seen as wrongly as traditionally male uh, that we encourage more women and girls to go into those uh, industries and into apprenticeships particularly. If I could give one example, uh, if we look at the Airbus Industrial uh, Cadets, uh, in, uh, this took 20, 70 female students from schools across the north of Wales through a 10-week programme with the support of female Airbus mentors and role uh, models. I think that's a, one example amongst many uh, that can be rolled out further to make sure that that gender imbalance that undoubtedly exists in some sectors uh, is addressed in the future. Question four, Lindsay Whittle. Uh, with, uh, First Minister, what progress is being made towards implementing the South East Wales Local Transport Plan? Please? Well, the implementation of the local transport plans is a matter for local authorities. First Minister, we know that one of the most important aims of the Assembly and future Assemblies is the economic regeneration of the South Wales Valleys, working closely with those same local authorities, whatever they may be. Uh, how will this local transport plan stimulate economic growth in the South East Wales Valleys? And in particular, do you think we should consider free transport to 16 to 25 year olds to assist them to increase their employment opportunities? Well, what we need to do is make sure that transport is affordable and available, which is why, of course, the Metro is so important, uh, to make sure that we have faster, more comfortable 
uh, more frequent uh, services across the uh, what will become the metro network and I look forward to uh, the UK government's uh, contribution to the uh, to the city deal particularly uh, which will uh, help to uh, to regenerate and, and to assist large parts of the southeast of Wales. Mohammed Ashka. Thank you Madam Presiding Officer. First Minister, the South East Wales Local Transport Plan forecasts a 20% increase in the number of residents commuting to work in the Cardiff region, capital region, in the next 25 years. What consideration has the Welsh Government given to the creation of a rail park and ride station similar to Bristol Parkway to service the major rail hub of Cardiff, which could also serve Cardiff Airport in the same time? Well, these are all matters wrapped up in the Metro because uh, we have made it clear that we are ambitious to create a fully integrated transport system that encompasses heavy rail, light rail, uh, bus rapid transit, uh, and that is something that is moving forward now apace. Question five, Kirsty Williams. Will the <coughs> First Minister make a statement on healthcare services in Brecon and Radnorshire? Well, we expect Powys Teaching Health Board to ensure the people of Brecon and Radnor have access to health services which are safe, sustainable and deliver the best possible clinical outcomes for patients. Uh, First Minister, the refurbishment work in Llandrindod Wells Hospital is well underway, which will allow us to bring new services to that community. Uh, one thing my constituents would dearly love to have in Llandrindod Wells Hospital and indeed other community hospitals is access to chemotherapy services. Uh, at present, many uh, constituents are travelling well over an hour to access chemo services in other district general hospitals, yet there are no clinical reasons why those services could not be provided uh, in community hospitals in Brecon and Radnorshire, thus negating the need to travel so far. What will the Welsh Government do to work with Powys Local Health Board to deliver chemotherapy services in our community hospitals? Well, I, first of all, I thank the uh, leader of the Liberal Democrats for the acknowledgement of the uh, investment at Llandrindod Wells. It does form part of the first phase of, a, of wider refurbishment proposals, which will total £5.3 million for essential hospital services on the site as part of the strategy to improve staff and patient environments, while, of course, enhancing the long-term viability of the hospital. Um, I will ask the Health Minister to write uh, on the particular issue of chemotherapy. I don't know whether there are clinical reasons. She's told me that there aren't. Uh, whether there are other reasons that prevent chemotherapy from being taken for certainly certain conditions on site, uh, but I will certainly investigate that and uh, make sure she gets a letter back. Sam Thomas. Uh, with Wilmar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, Brecon and Radnor and Mid Wales more generally is one of those areas where there are problems in terms of access to GPs, particularly in the evenings and on the weekends. Now, you're very fond of saying, First Minister, that you've increased the number of GPs 10% over the past 10 years. Now, the same increase in England over the same period is 20%, so every time you increase, we fall further behind. So what specifically do you have in place to attract GPs to somewhere like Mid Wales and West Wales too, where at the moment there isn't the kind of variety that is likely to attract those who would want to become partners, where it's even difficult to get employed GPs in place? Well, first of all, this is something which the Collaborative has been part of and has been working on for some time, looking at ways of attracting people into Mid Wales and ensuring that they remain there, of course. And this is something they've been working on, and it's extremely important if we were to consider POWIS, for example, that work has been done in Machantleth and in Newtown in order to ensure that the service is maintained for the population there. And so when matters do arise or issues arise as regards some surgeries, well, the board must ensure that the service is retained for the public there. The way the system works is this. The GPs are contractors and it's up to them to ensure that they adhere to the contract themselves. When they fail, then, of course, the health board can consider putting salaried doctors in in order to ensure that the service continues, and that's what's happened in Prestatyn in North Wales. Thank you, presiding officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on actions taken by the Welsh Government to reduce flooding risk in the future? 
Yes, uh, over the lifetime of this government, uh, we will have invested over £285 million across Wales to reduce flood risk and strengthen our resilience to climate change. Thank you for your response, Minister. Could you please clarify these areas of concern for me? That your government will give full consideration to the work being carried out by Aberystwyth University's River Dynamics and Hydrology Department, which challenges current thinking on floods in Wales, that the work to rethink and remap the drainage systems in the upland forest around Llan Roost will proceed urgently. I'm told these drainage systems do date back to the 1940s. And you will be aware that one hydro power station is already capable of discharging 8 million tonnes of water into the River Conway. Another is planned. Will your government be calling in the plan for Conway Falls at the head of this river? Well, uh, firstly, uh, we can't obviously uh, take the view of one person and one department and say that that necessarily is the only evidence in a particular area. Now, what needs to be looked at is the weight of evidence. It's a matter for NRW to, uh, to examine that. When it comes to flooding, especially around Llan Roost, I know that the uh, people who live in Llan Roost have been happy to see the work that's been uh, taken for. They visited Llan Roost on New Year's Eve. Mm. It was new, well, certainly New Year's Eve or a few days beforehand. I saw the work for myself. I spoke to local councillors. And they were able to demonstrate to me how the uh, flood defence schemes on the River Conway around Llan Roost had helped to make sure that Llan Roost didn't flood, particularly to the levels that it had in years gone by, particularly when groundwater was coming up through people's houses, uh, against which, of course, there, there is no defence. Uh, local authorities have the responsibility, of course, of uh, dealing with flooding. Uh, they, of course, are able to bid for grant funding for flood schemes. They've done that successfully around Wales. And NRW, of course, are also there to, uh, to advise as to how uh, flood schemes should be taken forward. Alan Fred Jones. Thank you very much. May I return to the statement made by Professor Mark Maiklin yesterday on what he suggested was that NRW weren't taking into account the historic floods on Welsh rivers. Now, constituents in my area suffered more than in any other part of Wales as a result of flooding on Boxing Day. And one of the very obvious problems was the experience of people on the ground and their memories of previous floods. And what's characteristic about the public meetings that I've attended is that the professionals aren't often aware of that at all. So I do think that Professor Mark Macklin has a point here. And do you believe that ignoring historic evidence such as this is acceptable and is good practice? Well, I don't pretend to be an expert in this field, but what I know is, and I understand that this research has been undertaken and I and realize that that is important. I'm not critical of that at all, but this is the view of one person and one group of researchers who've carried out this work. Of course, it's important to consider the work that they have undertaken and that evidence, but no one would expect the direction to change because of one piece of work and so what's important is that the work be considered and that that work adds to the corpus of evidence which already exists. First Minister, I'm sure you'll uh, join me uh, in applauding the UK government's last minute change of heart in uh, deciding after all to put in uh, a bid to the EU Solidarity Fund for uh, the relief of flood victims. Uh, I've been campaigning on this issue since uh, just after the Boxing Day uh, floods occurred, as indeed as my uh, UK party leader. And I wrote to David Liddington and Liz Truss on this matter, both pro-EU ministers. It would appear that the current uh, civil war within the government has at least enabled this wise decision uh, to, be, uh, to be agreed. First Minister, what can we now do to ensure that this much needed money from the European Solidarity Fund, when it is made available, is directed to those who need it most, and that we have as little as possible caught up in the uh, morass of UK uh, administration in this regard. Well, we are in discussion with the UK government on this. The best way of securing the funding is to stay in the EU, clearly. Uh, I take a very different, his, his view and, my, and uh, my view are, are similar, of course, mm. uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Mm. If the leader of the Welsh Conservatives had his way, the money wouldn't be there at all. 
uh, and those people would not be uh, would not be helped. But certainly, uh, staying within the uh, EU, he says I like debated. I mean, he, well, this, is, this is the man who said he's not going to debate anything on the EU. Yeah, but there we are. Uh, and we're still waiting for the we're still waiting for the article he was going to write to justify why he's selling farmers down the river. But I accept that that's yeah, not uh, the, not the point on this occasion. It's important we stay in the EU to uh, make sure that we're able to access that money to help our people. Um. <coughs> It's good of you to answer questions, First Minister, but when he's sitting down, he's not actually asking you a question, so you don't have to respond. Um, question seven, Mick Antony. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's priorities for small businesses in Tafili? Yes, wide-ranging support is available through our Business Wales service and via a range of business rates initiatives for businesses in the Taf Ely area and across Wales. Well, First Minister, your Welsh Labour pledges in respect of the renewal and extension of small business allowances have been very well received in the Pontypridd High Street and by small businesses. I suppose my concern is really to, uh, of course, we have many other small towns there, Ponteclean, Tonnerevel, Tolbert Green, with vibrant uh, uh, communities of retail there. Uh, I wonder if you could perhaps outline to what extent that policy would benefit those small businesses and what the benefits might be to the high street in our, uh, our small towns in uh, South Wales. Yes, indeed. It'll, it'll benefit... Uh it will benefit all those who uh, qualify for the relief. We expect three quarters of, uh, bus of small businesses to uh, be affected positively. We expect about half not to pay business rates at all. These are difficult times, particularly in the retail sector for SMEs. We are committed to assist our high street. That's why, of course, we're going to reduce taxes for small businesses. Andrew Archie Davis. Um, First Minister, obviously the Welsh Conservative have a long-standing policy on business rates to exclude all businesses with a rate of a value up to £12,000 and taper that up to £15,000. For I think nine years now we've been pressing a Welsh Labour government to try and implement such a business rate relief policy. Your member for Pontypridd touched on your policy that you announced at your conference. Can you explain, will it be as generous as the Welsh Conservative policy or is it merely an extension? <laughs> Is it merely an extension of what is currently in place, which is up to £6,000 business rate relief? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know what his policy is. Yeah. <laughs> I just told I mean, you. He keeps, on, uh, he keeps on saying that uh, his party has policies. I mean, what, what's odd is that he keeps on saying we have policies, I've just told you. And yet, when, when I produce uh, the document that his own party uh, produced that shows the cuts they propose to make, that's not his policy. Yeah. No, 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 that's, that's, that's an old policy. That's not his policy. The reality is we have produced a policy that will be a benefit to small businesses across Wales. We have explained it and we have costed it. The small business owners of Wales wait to see what he will say once he's crunched his numbers. Question eight, Andrew Archie Davis. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the action being taken by the Welsh Government yeah. to tackle cancer waiting times currently experienced by patients in South Wales Central? Well, I'll try to answer his fifth question. Uh, cancer is a top priority for the NHS and our government, and we're continuing to make progress in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. More people are being diagnosed with cancer in Wales, but more people than ever are being treated in survival rates at an all-time high. I'm sorry it troubles you that I've had five questions this afternoon. I think it's called democracy, First Minister. Like but, uh, I appreciate it's not much of that in the Labour Party. The Cardiff and Vale cancer wait times de decline to 65% of patients who are diagnosed under the cancer urgent suspect route. Ultimately, the average, the national average, is only 83%. Your own target here in Wales is for 95% of patients to be referred within the time frame. That target has never been met since 2008, First Minister. With Cardiff and the Vale having the poorest referral times, what action is the Welsh Government taking to make sure that those times are moved closer to the Welsh Government's own target so that when someone does get the devastating diagnosis of cancer, they can be assured that they'll be put on the right treatment path in the time that they expect to be treated in? No problem with him asking a number of questions. It'll be backbenchers who will uh, feel that, that uh, they're not able to ask uh, questions. Well, computer, that, that's for another time. I mean, he asked a question about uh, Cardiff and the Vale. I mean, Cardiff plays an important role in respect of specialist services, alongside more routine services for its local uh, population. It does offer that uh, service, so there is greater pressure on Cardiff and the Vale. For example, referrals over the last year have been 17% higher than the previous year. So Cardiff has needed to see and treat more patients. Uh, nevertheless, there has been an improvement in performance for December uh, of last year, a 10% improvement, in fact, at 71%. That's the best performance since May. 
And he talks about cancer, uh, about figures for cancer waiting times in Wales. They have consistently been better than England. Uh, yes, that's true to say we haven't reached targets because our targets are more ambitious. That much is true. But nevertheless, when it comes to cancer, we've consistently shown that if people want to get diagnosis and treatment, then the figures in Wales are better. Question nine, Rina Fjordworth. Part of this. What discussions has the First Minister had with the UK government regarding electoral reorganisation? Well, I don't quite know what the member means by electoral reorganisation, but I can say that no such discussions have taken place. I'm referring to last week's announcement that there is intention to reduce the number of members of parliament from 40 to 29 in Wales. I have no opposition in principle in reducing the number of MPs, but of course Wales is experiencing more than a share of the cuts that are being proposed. There are some exceptions to the changes, namely some of the Scottish Isles and the Isle of Wight with their status as islands, meaning that they do have the right to remain as distinct constituencies. The same isn't true here in Wales with Anis Morn. The risk, I think, of merging Anis Morn where most of the population of any constituency would live with a small part of the mainland, was that that would be, be a disservice to Anismorn and that small part of the mainland. So would the First Minister join with me in calling for the exception of Anismorn also? The member is asking a very clever question on behalf of his uh, electorate and his constituency and... Uh, on behalf of Holly Head, of course, I'm not in favour of cutting the numbers of MPs they have in Westminster because that would be diluting the voice of Wales. And the member makes his point very strongly to the boundaries commissioner once that process takes place. Yeah, yeah. Your government's first local government Wales bill detailed total costs to the local democracy boundary commission for Wales of over four million pounds to undertake boundary reviews even though final directions have not yet been issued with regards to undertaking these. How, could you advise us to the full costings associated with these reviews, considering none of us know yet what those final directions are going to be? Does this figure include the cost of the proposed final directions, and have you actually allocated any money in, in, in respect of this? Well, given the fact that the question is about discussions with the UK government, I've had no discussions with the UK government on this point. Thank you, First Minister. We now move to the next item of business.